let's start with, with Harry and William. I mean, this isn't just a tabloidy kind of story. I mean, it's, you know, he's the future of our monarchs. And if, if these two don't get it together, it, does sh it just sh changes the shape of the royal family in years to come. It will literally be a very isolated Prince William and Harry sort of a has-been part of the royal family. So it is quite significant. They come to a funeral. We've all been to funerals, and you think that could be a time to sort of unite. Yeah. But it feels like... They haven't. They've not been seen speaking to each other and they weren't sat next to each other. Well, what, what do we know about well, this? Well, it's baby steps, so, you know, right. um, the, let's see what happens. I mean, in the week that Liam and Noel got back together, there is hope. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> if they can do I it, love everything God, we talk about you know. links to Oasis somehow. <laughs> they could have a sell-out tour, <laughs> couldn't they? <laughs> Who knows? But, I mean, it's quite... On one, I mean, it's quite positive because I've been quite critical of a lot of the things Harry has said publicly about sharing secrets. That doesn't help to get the family back together when you're spilling the beans mm. on all sorts of things. But actually, this seems to have been a very pri obviously a very private funeral. Mm. We won't know exactly what happened, but I think sometimes with fa within families, whether they're royal or not, it's baby steps to bring people <coughs> together, mm. you know. And, mm. you know, I hope they do sort it out. Yeah, I hope they do sort it, it out. Be, mm. Ed, I mean, if you think about it, how, how important is this? If these two did get together, it does change a lot, doesn't it? Like how, yeah, I think it does. Know, I mean, I like, uh, I like the idea of thought of William and Harry playing Glastonbury <laughs> when they finally unite, <laughs> announcing tour dates in Cardiff and Belfast and so on. But uh, it is painful. I mean, obviously, we don't know uh, the inside story at all. A lot of it is speculation. I have no idea whether they did, in fact, perhaps meet away from mm. the funeral. And it's a very poignant funeral because, of course, it's Diana's yeah. brother-in-law, their mother's yeah. brother-in-law. Uh, but I think it is painful. And I think, you know, in terms of right and wrong, there are... There are arguments, as it were, for both sides. I think if I was William, I'd feel very badly let down because you've got this huge responsibility. You're going to end up being the monarch. You would want your brother to be beside you in some yeah. way, supporting you. Uh, but also, I think Harry, you know, he has this uh, trauma, I think, uh, mm -hmm. from his mother's death and the way, it was, the way she was treated that has finally kind of pushed him to say, I'm out of here, I'm off. So there's kind of arguments for both sides if you're a friend of... Either one, you'd be able to mm. sort of put a case. But obviously, as, as a family, it's a very sad thing to see. Mm. And, and you would have thought there'd be some opportunity for them as mm. brothers, and they grew up very close together, uh, united by this trauma, that they would just be able to sit down and just kind of talk to each other about what's going on. Yeah. I mean, Lady Jane Spencer, their aunt, you know, <laughs> mum and sister, um, losing her husband, you, you would wonder if that sort of emotion that comes when you think of times past... And, exactly. Uh, yeah. ..and the grief that you're feeling that, that may have forged a softening. Yeah, you know, and you would have seen... Hurt. They would have seen so many people from their life over the last uh, yeah. 30 or 40 years at that mm. funeral again, so... And uh, their cousins as well, exactly. you know, the children of, uh, yeah. you know, Robert Fellows and, yeah. and mm. Jane as well. Just before we move on from the Royals, we're talking after seven about um, the bringing uh, the environmental process to the King's backyard, the takeover of Extinction Rebellion of Windsor Great Park. Um, I wonder what you feel, we're, we're debating this after seven, whether it's, it's rather ironic that the, the, the monarch who did so much for environmental issues would have that, whether he'd like it, whether he'd welcome it, whether it's a step too far. What are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, climate change protesters really annoy me because they kind of are self-appointed <laughs> uh, stewards of the planet when we're all stewards of the planet and everyone is trying to do their bit. I'm sure Caroline will point out we've got a new Labour government which is re-emphasising under Ed oh, Miliband. Oh, you noticed that, did you, Ed? Re-emphasising <laughs> under Ed Miliband clean energy and renewables. And again, you know gluing yourself to roads and all that jazz, uh, and taking on the king, if this is kind of what the subliminal message is, is completely nuts, because obviously in 1970, more mm. than 50 years ago, as a young Prince of Wales, he made that famous speech on Earth mm. Day. He was one of the pioneers of And many of, of those in the Great campaigning. Park probably weren't born when yeah. he made that yeah. speech, yeah. ironically. Yeah. And the king yeah. will wave as he drives past in his Aston Martin powered by vegetable oil. You know. <laughs> Although saying that, Kate, I mean, some of the people involved in um, Extinction Rebellion are, you know, of a rather mature age. Um, mm. So you think they would know that, you know, it's not all run by sort of young mm. people. I, look, I, th you know, I wouldn't say that all climate protests is bad, um, <laughs> but I think the problem with this group is that they, you know, they often, in this case, are going against someone who has got, whatever you say, has got a good track record of calling mm. out on these issues. 
but also it just doesn't help. I think they just, you know, when they stop yeah, right. people a... getting to work, it's, it's just counter... You know, it's counter... Well, does it not help? I mean, they will argue. I mean, we, we can sometimes go about our lives and we can be quite naive and forget about these issues. And, and one thing they have done, I mean, they get us talking about it. And here we, we probably wouldn't have talked about climate change this morning on morning television. They've got us talking about it. And in the end, that is probably one of the aims of their campaign, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, they're very good at publicity, aren't they? And I suppose part of the, of the whole thing about Windsor Park and the King is... Everyone's going to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, what are they going to do? Mm. What's going to happen? You know, uh, you know, where but are they going to sit? Where are they going to But also, what's themselves? their bright idea? What is going to come out of today that's going to yeah. change well, think, but, but climate isn't change that the, policy and make us but do isn't, more? It's, it's almost not their job to come out with a bright idea. I mean, the thing interesting, we've just had a general election. Climate change is probably one of the biggest things that's going to affect, affect this planet, affect us all. It wasn't, it wasn't even part of the sort of campaigns. We didn't hear anything from well, either I mean, side I about think, climate I think, change. I think you've got a point, and we are talking about it today, when yesterday we might have talked about the Mayor's report on the uh, EULA's extension, mm. highly controversial mm. uh, tax, if you like, but actually this report has said that it's had an impact, that it's reduced uh, nitrous dioxide emissions by the equivalent of 200,000 cars. Lots of cities around the world now looking at this kind of pollution tax. Those are the kind of measures, in my view, mm. that have a really mm. effective mm. impact in terms of health mm. and climate change, not these demos. But you are right. The mm. only reason we're talking about yeah. climate change is because they're going to take over with the Great Park. And it's yeah. never in the top three, anywhere near. I'm not even probably in the top five of issues that the public, mm. from all shades of opinion, actually think is the most important priority for them. Yeah. Well, pollution of a different sort that we had as our lead story yesterday and is on a lot of the front pages today, and that's a potential extension oh, yeah. of the smoking ban surrounding now outside pubs, uh, outside stadiums, children's playgrounds, mm -hmm. areas like that. Uh, Skir Sam has confirmed that he is looking at um, an extension of of the bans that are already in place. And he said he starts from a position that 80,000 people lose their lives, needlessly from Smokey, every year. So why not? But it's made him somewhat unpopular as well, hasn't it? Well, um, having gone through the first ban, and, in fact, was Public Health Minister at the time when we brought that in... <laughs> Were you? <laughs> I forgot I have, that. I have got, as they would say, some previous on this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Skin in the game. <laughs> so, so uh, what was it like then? People hated yeah. it and then realised yeah. it well, was good. Well, I mean, what it was like then, actually, when I became Public Health Minister, it was a slightly different policy than where we ended up. Yeah. But, um, actually, it was the usual headlines, Nanny State, right. Nanny Flint, <laughs> all this thing thrown at me. Um, it won't work. Snatcher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> She's, you know, party pooper and all this Fact sort of thing, you know. Um... <laughs> <laughs> um, You've been working on that for a while. I wish I'd seen that on a headline. I, my I, head. I wish I'd have seen that on a headline. It was pretty good, actually. I could have framed it. But you know, yeah. but you know, we went through all that then. But the truth is, is that you know, people started to really understand the impact of you know, inhaling other mm. people's smoke, you know, pa passive smoking, and in not just in pubs and clubs, but sports centres, you know, all sorts of I mean, people. But today, yeah. it is out... I know it, we sort of moved how on. Did you, uh, how to... did you extend the policy? Because I remember <sighs> voting against the policy when I was an MP, and a Labour cabinet minister came up to me and said, thank you for voting for the Labour manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> you, you extended the ban further well, than the manifesto. I well, we... we well, what we did was we actually yeah. ended up with a free vote, which was actually oh, yeah. really helpful to get to corral people around. Oh, right. But, I mean, look, I think we've moved on. It's 17 years since yeah. that legislation that I was really proud to be part of. As you say, Kate, it's still, you know, the number one cause of preventable death and also illness in this country. And, and I think the, the mood has moved on as well. Two are poll, polls that have come out, despite the headlines in the usual suspects in the media, print media, have actually said, yeah, they're in favour of looking at We did a things. poll yesterday. It yeah. was very slightly 53%, I think, in favour yeah. of extending the yeah. ban. Yeah. Uh, and slightly less wanted it to keep safe. I, I wonder if the only problem is, is that, you know, some of the things that are cited is saving money for the NHS. Mm. Um, but actually, there's a huge amount amount that's of revenue that's raised from smoking isn't it and for those people that do still smoke it can feel demonizing uh, on one level because yeah. you're already not smoking in a pub garden you're already yeah. and the yeah. hospitality and pub industry every say, uh, we are on our i mean every fiber anyway. in my being wants to oppose this policy but i mm. have to acknowledge yeah having voted against it when i was an mp you now look back you know we banned smoking on the tube after the horrific king's cross fire mm. You and it now smoke. seems bewildering exactly. that anybody did. You can't did, smoke on airplanes, you yeah. can't smoke in pubs and restaurants. It would now be 
really weird. It's amazing mm. how kind of culture changes. Mm. It'd be really weird if somebody lit up a fag in a restaurant that looked yeah. kind of bizarre. I... But having said that, there is politics here, which mm. however much the public might quietly support this, now however much rationally we think it's the right thing to do, it does very early on in the Labour government, and even weirdly, it's pretty much a Tory policy because Rishi Sunak effectively mm. wanted to mm -hmm. phase out smoking. It does, it, it's a risk for the Labour government because it, it's a, but, an easy label to say you're authoritarian, mm, you're anti-business, mm. and if that label sticks as, it, as the Labour government goes, and that's what, progresses, that's, that's that will one, be a danger. That's what those parties who are against what we did 17 years ago will try to do again. There's going to be a consultation. I mean, look, my, I'll put my cards on the table. I think, for example, children's playgrounds... I don't think, you know, we should have smoke in there. I don't think it's, a, you know, a good thing to be doing there. I think in... I don't believe, to be honest, probably have a load of people come at me on this, I don't believe the issue around our pubs and their decline is all down to smoking. I think there's a lot of other factors that go in there. I do think, you know, when you're in a pub garden, you know, sometimes if you're a non-smoker and you're not sort of next to someone on a table, you're breathing it all in. Mm. And so maybe they're going to have to come up with something. Interestingly, Deborah Arnott, who is the chief exec of the charity Action on Smoking and Health, has said that she does think there should be more restrictions in sort of outdoor public spaces. But she has also said there needs to be some outdoor spaces where smokers well, I've, can go I've been rather in, than so, I've been in some pub gardens the where they actually have a smoking area yeah. in the pub gardens. Yeah. Like if you want, you go and sit yeah. in a certain place or go and stand, out, stand in a, under a shed or something. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, it's not glamorous, but... But, but, if, you think about the, yeah, but if you think about the practicalities, <laughs> if you ban smoking in a garden, you, instead, what will they do? They will go out and stand on the pavement. So you could you have... You couldn't do it on the pavement in front and, of the and, pub. And, and no, then he no, wants to... So you're going to have people who are slightly, maybe a bit tipsy, a bit drunk, out on the street, having a fag. How many could be there, I mean, in fact. So the practical. Well, some of them are already there because lots of pubs don't exactly. have a garden, so yeah. they're all out there anyway. Yeah. So I mean, I think the practicalities are are are, are strange, but. What, why has Starmer gone for this? Like you say, it is slightly think, unpopular. He's barely been in the job, you know, 100 days or whatever it is. But every go, day is about how grim go, the October. Yeah, you know, it feels like he's getting it all out it's there. Like it's been, but I, I think it's sort of... if People accuse Starmer of not having a vision and not having mm. ideas. And then he has come out with this, and I think it is about... I wouldn't talk about so much saving money in the NHS. Of course it will save money, but I think it's actually about prevention. Mm. I mean, isn't it better that we support people to, you know, look after themselves rather than having to just have treatment all the time. And one of the... I mean, amazing, I looked at a graph, you know, last night on this and just the timeline from when the first ban was introduced. It was really amazing and, and it's why mm. it's one of the things, proudest things I've been involved in in politics. You know, the number of smokers who gave up went up mm. hugely. Mm. Um, but also, you know, we've seen the rates going down. So I think that's where public opinion has moved. And one yeah. of the good things last time as well, and we'll see with this new proposal, is actually we hardly had any prosecutions because actually public actually came behind it. And, became, no. and, and I also... think the momentum is with, is with the government on this, actually. The more I think about it, and funnily enough, uh, it risks... You know, Farage thinks this is a great issue for him and, you know, here's my pint and my fag and here we go. Actually, I think it's going to make him look out of touch mm. and out of mm. date the more he bangs on about this and I think people will be irritated that all he wants to talk about is... Uh, having a fag outside your local pub instead of the real issues... If you could see him in your very... local pub if he's not <laughs> in America all the time. <laughs> no. uh, the Times also has another uh, health story, a national drive to offer uh, a health MOT to the over 40. So the idea would be that the NHS, already Land Rover is one of the firms that signed up to this, would go into workplaces and say to people over 40, come and have a test, have your cholesterol, be weighed... Let's have a look at you and then offer you support. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? Because I can imagine some oh, people will be thinking... hundred percent. You are too much in agreement on this. No, I mean, I think uh, I go to my GP every year and try and get a health checkup, and I get told to stop weight. drinking and lose weight. Uh, very helpful. And uh, I go back and have... Do a... they say that every year? Yeah, <laughs> I go back and I have my... Let's look fried, at last year's. I have my fried <laughs> breakfast to celebrate that I'm still alive. <laughs> uh, but uh, yesterday we were talking uh, about... Um, the weigh-in at London Zoo. So I've got a new euphemism for fat people like me. I'm fat. I'm not being fattest. I'm a fat person. Penguins, before they molt their feathers, stuff their face because really? once they've molted, they can't go in the water to fish because they're not waterproof. And it's called ah. catastrophic molting. So the next time somebody says, I'm fat, I'll say, I'm not. I'm just... <laughs> 
I'm imminently going to catastrophically molt. <laughs> I, I was, so I, we'll suddenly see you slimmer without a beard and hair. Exactly. Will when we? I have my beard oh, yeah, shaved tomorrow, <laughs> the weight's going to drop off. That will be off. your catastrophic molt. It, it explains right. some of the waddling when you're walking <laughs> yeah. around. To the um, oh. Can we talk about something fairly serious? This is, well, very serious, in fact. The, the I a newspaper have done an investigation into the far-right mm. activist Tommy Robinson. This is frightening. Yeah. Tommy Robinson is, is alleged to have tried to coordinate an anti-Muslim protest in response to the pro-Palestinian protest. Yeah. I mean, he tried to mobilise football hooligans. Mm. Apparently, he's got history himself, being part of football hooligan groups. I mean, they, they are a scary bunch, we know about them. But the thing I find frightening as a Muslim, you know, he's, he's got to approach people who are of the Sikh faith. Yeah. What on earth, you know, has it got anything to do with them? People of Jewish backgrounds, of Hindu backgrounds. Mm. It, because he was opposed to some of these pro-Palestinian marches. I find it really interesting, he didn't approach any Muslim groups. He didn't go to any Muslim groups and say, well, look, do you oppose these marches? So, mm. clearly, it's anti-Muslim. Mm. I mean, he tries mm. to use words like jihad or whatever and to try and skirt around it. But the eye have done a very detailed uh, explanation and they've got a comment from him and he's just literally doubled down and pushed back on it yeah. and, and just this idea about mainstream media and it's all fake news and he'll do what he wants and he's it's a, a crusade against jihad. He's yeah. a hateful person and, yeah. I mean, this... I mean, I think this sort of reveals what... Lots of us have already known he is anti-Muslim. You're absolutely right. He is trying to sow division. This isn't just someone on social media with a loud hailer shouting. There's lots of those. Mm. Um, this guy has got a plan. Mm. Um, what concerns me is... I mean, it concerns me that we even use Tommy Robinson as if it's some sort of, like, Robin Hood name or Dick yeah. Turpin, mm. rather than his real name, which is Stephen Yaxley Lennon. That's right. Um, <clears throat> And we almost create this sort of character. Yep. But the other thing is about this too, and I think this is, you know, really something, you know, government and law enforcement should look at, is he has clearly got a sophisticated network as well and a lot of money coming in behind him. We have laws against um, promoting hate and I think, you know, go for the organisations, go for the money, because uh, that's what we do mm. with serious criminals in this Ed, country. The, the we go is, for that. You know, he, he probably skirts around the law in a very clever way. Over the years, he's got, if you like, better at it. Do, do you think that there is something illegal going on here? Is there something that the, 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 the police and... Well, I don't know, secrets, but obviously... You know, uh, MI5 or whatever know, can investigate? Inciting hatred, inciting violence is, exactly. violence is illegal, and I'm sure that the police are onto him, and I think it is right that, um, you know, the far right is treated as a threat to our... Civil society and How come civil can order. Still do it then. What, what can the police Well, it depends. I mean, people do... people have yeah. a right to organise and people have a right to free speech. But you you know there are boundaries, yeah. quite rightly, on what you yeah. are able to do. And it so is he just right... clever and stays just the right? Well, he's just out he does. He's he out does. And he does. At the moment, he isn't does. He? And he doesn't. Avoiding he has a court appearance, so mm. he's in yeah. contempt of court. Yeah. I think it's two um, yeah. uh, charges of contempt in court. He's meant to be back. I think. In October, yeah, I, I, so we'll see what happens mm. then. Yeah, I don't have Tommy Robinson's charge sheet, Stephen Yaxley Lennon's charge sheet in front of me, or indeed what his convictions have been in the past, but there's no doubt that he has in the past uh, been charged with offences, and um, there's no doubt at all that he's not being given a free pass here, but as I say, people are allowed to organise and they're allowed to discuss things even if they're unpalatable, but there are clear laws. Mm. But look, we're getting away from the main point here, which is that there is a organised kind of far-right movement in this country that wants to sow uh, division. And it's yeah. like a full-time job and it's a kind of full-time organisation. And they mm. will try and get... Uh, mm. The BNP, for example, never obtained uh, elected office. Margaret Hodge in Barking very bravely fought back against them when they won because... council seats. And you've got to... So at the same time as using the law, you do have to... And this is not appeasement. You do have to take on the arguments. You have to be organised and campaign against... Them. Exactly. You know, and this is very damaging and painful and hurtful for Muslim people. There'll yeah. be, you know, be, there'll be mums and dads getting their kids ready for summer school, schools next mm -hmm. week. You know, it's a frightening yeah. time for them. We've seen what's happened a few weeks ago in this yeah. country. It is anti-Muslim hate. You know, nearly three million Muslims in this country. We know... 99.999% of them are exactly. good people. Exactly. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm against a terrorist as much as you are and anybody else is. Yeah. You know, and yeah. we, you know we, they bring a bad name to Islam, as, you know, and we feel that as well. And it's just sort of... It, I just wonder when will this stop? Because if this is allowed to fester, we know this is going on. With, he's now got well, a million followers or something on, on social yeah. media. Okay. That These little incidents and these... The, the, the potential of these uh, protests and riots will always uh, be, yeah. be, be, be around. And I think that's why, you know, this isn't just a man with a loud hailer yeah. via social media. 
this is part of an organised disruption, as far yeah. as I can see it. And, you know, getting others to do your bidding as well um, is, you know, part of this sort of whole profile. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I mean... Um, but it, it, is a, it, it is exposed as to what it is. Mm. Anti-Muslim, provo provoking anti-Muslim... Uh, uh, it it, it, it is a Western phenomenon. You know, uh, Kamala Harris gave her first interview last night. Uh, we're 68 days away or something from the... Presidential election, Donald Trump could still win that. You've got uh, Marie mm. Le Pen in France. The reason France is in chaos uh, is because the far right did so well in the European elections. You've got the AFD yeah. in uh, Germany rising. Yeah. They may win three states in Germany at the next election. So this mm. is a phenomenon uh, which has to be addressed. And so, on the one hand, you have to show kind of zero tolerance to illegal behaviour, but you also do have to, I'm afraid, uh, come, on to the, come into the arena and debate these issues and win the argument. Yeah. Mm. OK. Um, just something that's also made uh, the, the lot of the newspapers very cross, and others too in the Conservative <laughs> Party, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher's uh, picture has been taken out. Baroness Thatcher's been taken down. Uh, it was hanging in a room that was her study, I believe, when she was there well, as the Prime Thatcher Minister. Room. The Thatcher room, indeed. Have you, been, have, you been in, have you both been in that room? No, have you seen think, it? I don't remember being in that room. No. I think it's a study, so it's not one of the necessary ones. I think it's when you're really to. naughty. Have you been in there? I've been in there. Oh. Have you? Oh, you've been there. So, apparently, this emerged because Tom Baldwin is, is uh, Sir Keir Starmer's biographer, and when he was talking to him, I think they were in the Thatcher room. Um, and he said, oh, doesn't that make you feel a bit uncomfortable? And he said, yes, it does. We might yeah. take it down. This is such a good story. And he has. This is such a good story on Isn't so many levels. Because because the, first, the, first, the first story which really has to be written is how irritated is Keir Starmer with Tom, Tom Baldwin? Because yeah, exactly. he said this at some festival, you know. With friends like having that. a private with friends chat. Like that. Apparently, he's Tom... apparently he's taken Tom Baldwin's photo down <laughs> now as well. So. Oh, I imagine. So Tom, <laughs> Baldwin, imagine. Tom Baldwin is Keir Starmer's biography. Oh, biography is getting a lot of mileage from the private conversations. I mean, he was with Keir Starmer. <laughs> on election night, so he's got another great story. Oh, That's dear. issue number one. Issue number two, it's, it's a classic one that gets everyone foaming at the mouth. Oh, now, God. you remember when Obama mm. was accused of removing Winston Churchill's oh, bus? That's you right. Know, you could expect a <laughs> Boris Johnson column on the Thatcher portrait yeah. landing on your desk on yeah. Saturday morning because he milked that for all it was worth when Obama was accused. Of course, Obama had moved the church. Or Maybe that's the ploy to get, to get some of these conservatives, you know, championing Thatcher <laughs> and writing about <laughs> that. that. Unite the be, party. That Unite could be, the, that the could be part of the ploy. Oh. You know, this is the thing Although that glue them together. Although it was commissioned by Gordon Brown. I know. I know. Wasn't it? In 2007. He had... Uh, he'd invited... Um, then Baroness Thatcher, I think, to uh, number uh, 10 shortly after he became Prime Minister. And then, I think it was consequent, commissioned the, the portrait, you know. So, so yeah, interesting. Lovely. <laughs> well, <laughs> We're out of time, which means we haven't got time to tell you how lying in at the weekend is healthy for you. Oh, thank You're goodness, for that. <laughs> thank goodness for that. <laughs> to develop a heart disease. So here we are on a Friday. Lie in tomorrow, yeah. everybody. Apparently so. Good morning, Britain is it on air and you can sleep in <laughs> exactly. because apparently it does. It's very good for you. Yeah. Great. There you go.